Hey everyone, welcome to Neighbor Science Season 3. Uh, I'm Ryan Salisbury, and today I have a new uh, co-host, Chris. Hey everybody, it's Chris. Uh, you can find him at... Solidarity Goth, that's Solidarity underscore Goth. <laughs> <laughs> I love that handle. Um, so to start off Season 3, um, we're going to... Uh, tying together our two favorite subjects, political economy and anime. That's right. We're weebs. <laughs> we're going uh, full weeb history today. It's pretty so bad. We're talking about the uh, political economy of the Tokugawa shogunate uh, in medieval Japan. It's wild shit, guys. Yeah. So we spent a lot of time talking about the modern system of political economy, uh, but we have yet to get much into any of the systems of the ancient or medieval period. Um so, you know, it's kind of interesting to know, like, what, what the differences are between what we have today and what we had before. Um, yeah, so today we're going to be talking about the system of political economy in late medieval Japan during the Muromachi and Edo period. So I think Chris knows a little bit more about the um, show, show-in system. Is that what it's called? Well, I, know, I definitely know a lot more about the social and political history of Japan since that was uh, one of the focuses that I took in undergrad. Um, some of the technicalities I've forgotten over over the years since I'm an old bastard, but I can definitely keep up with you since you did a lot of this research. Um, <laughs> so depends on what you want me to start off with. Uh, if you want me to talk about like the eras of Japanese history leading up to the Bakufu, we can do that. Or we can talk about some of the technical um, terminology and, and features. Yeah, let's let's go over some of the terminology because we're just going to be starting to throw in a lot of it. All right. Um, so, what 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 is a bakufu exactly? So, the bakufu is basically this kind of bureaucratic government that the uh, shoguns were more or less in charge of through through uh, throughout this era. Um, they set it up as a method of taxation and control of the Japanese territories, these fiefdoms that uh, ultimately the Tokugawa shogunate unified under their rule uh, hereditarily. Um, but the Bakufu was essentially various landholders holder, uh, known as daimyo, or which is literally just big landholder, yeah. a big private landholder, like a fucking like, corporate daddy. Um, <laughs> imperial officials of various kinds, you know, a lot of bureaucrats and stuff, and then military officers... Um, who were also, you know, like bureaucratized samurai and various other kinds of, um, you know, dudes with swords and pens. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so the system we're, we're going to be talking about is called the Tokugawa Bakufu. So that mm -hmm. that that is a um, a system of government basically by a military bureaucracy and sort of dictatorship kind of thing essentially I, dictatorship. I, I try to avoid the word dictatorship because it's sort of meaningless yeah yeah and it's and it's very like 21st or 20th century yeah. reminiscent but yeah um, but it's a it's a useful analog controlled by the military. right yeah controlled by the military um they in particular love bureaucracy and standardized systems so yeah that worked out for them yeah so um prior to the tokugawa period um, taxation and control of Japan was through this Byzantine set of relationships with uh, landholders, uh, imperial offices. Um, like, like through all these periods, the emperor still gives legitimacy to whoever's in charge. Mm -hmm. um, but there's various systems of uh, control, whether directly from the emperor or, uh, you know, kind of convoluted ways to circumvent his power. Exactly. Exactly. The emperor, if, you know... If some of you are not weaves like us or our other uh, listeners <laughs> um, or just, you know, are not as familiar with, like, Japanese history um, and the kind of theological, cosmological aspects of their, of their political theories, um, the traditional view was that the emperor was a descendant of, um, you know, the, this, these gods, and we don't have to get into that, but basically they legitimized any other rule and control of Japan, which was kind of a general ethno-state, more or less. Um, and so then the shogun, throughout various eras in Japanese history, was a military uh, leader who would then take the emperor under uh, his protection at various times of crisis and then just kind of run things from there. And that was really the dynasties that kind of made all the decisions. Right, and so from 
around 800 to the Meiji Restoration, the Shogun was essentially the person that was in charge. And uh, what, one thing that's interesting about that is uh, Shogun is short for uh, Sei Tai Shogun. And the translation for that is Great General Who Subdues the Eastern Barbarians, uh, which was developed for the first Shogun to refer to the subjugation of the Ainu people. Right. Who they're northern indigenous people to Japan that are sort of, I think they're distantly related to uh, the Taiwanese. Yeah, the the Ainu have, I, I don't remember exactly kind of what their uh, their own ethnic lineage is, but they're definitely like this um, extreme minority now, um, yeah. but they used to be uh, indigenous to a vast swath of the Japanese islands. And yeah, mm-hmm. like, uh, you know, there are other minorities that a lot of people don't necessarily know of in the West uh, who live in Japan or one time lived in Japan or were assimilated by what we know as the, like Japanese. Yeah, what's that one place there in Honshu? Is that what it is? So Honshu is the central island. That's yeah. the big one oh, okay. um, where like a lot of this political stuff was centered. Yeah. And that was kind of the, the epicenter of um, kind of their initial uh, settler colonization from the mainland mm-hmm. and that's not something they like to talk about because it disrupts their narrative and we don't have to get into that either <laughs> but basically um, a bunch of people from you know uh, what seems to be no- northeast China and the Korean Peninsula got on some boats went over to where a bunch of other people were living on these islands settled there among them and then more and more became kind of cinified over the years um imitating chinese customs and maybe taking some of the kind of korean style customs with them as well uh through again kind of somewhat unknown uh, uh lineages and uh for whatever purposes we may not ever discover um but then they assimilated and or dominated and or um essentially chased off um or 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 you know, maybe genocide is a good word for some of these conflicts. Yeah. Um, the other people that lived in the islands throughout the other islands that they didn't initially settle. So that's a tangent. Yeah. I think they re- I think the Japanese government recently, like within the last decade mm-hmm. or so, apologized for the treatment of the Ainu people. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There's been a little bit more recognition lately yeah. um, as they've kind of opened up about these these past issues. Yeah. They, of course, too would like to late, leave though, it in probably. the past. <laughs> exactly. Um, so, yeah, again, the previous system uh, was a, you know, it was this complicated set of relationships between mm-hmm. different landholders. So the, right. the control of everything was very decentralized. Mm-hmm. Um, the Shogun didn't have a whole lot of power. Um so it, it was what Oda Nobunaga tried to unify Japan, right? And then right. he After was, many things and then happened. he was killed <laughs> and then um, the project was actually completed by Tokugawa Ieyasu. Yeah. So, so the, uh, that is one of the most famous and kind of celebrated uh, eras of transformation in Japanese history, right? Initially there was a previous shogunate, which itself had succeeded from a previous shogunate era, um, and some and some uh, some sort of imperial tussling and some kind of like high culture, high art uh, periods. Um, so the Ashikaga shogunate uh, had ruled through what I guess we could consider the early med- medieval uh, era of Japan, but the the first half of that era was fraught with competition uh, with supporters of the imperial direct rule from the previous previous era and so <laughs> the ashikaga shoguns for i think it was about a couple hundred maybe 250 years or so um the first several had to deal with imperial resistance and and uh you know kind of you know in europe you might have thought of them as like kind of royalists or something you know like the cavaliers um but then after they kind of quashed that there was a brief stint of peace kind of dabbling in peace and then kind of everything began to just disintegrate into squabbles between the fiefdoms, the the various daimyo, these private landholders, um, various military interests, um, conspiracies among officials, Mm -hmm. and so forth. And of course, your merchants and farming peasants and other classes and and clades of people were caught up in it, and they had to sort of figure their, their shit out from there. But it all culminated in the rather ruthless project of Oda Nobunaga, who was this brilliant general mm-hmm. um, of 
basically creating coalitions, forcing capitulation of, of, of you know, inferiors, as he might have thought of them, um, or just weaker uh, parties. Then when he finally captured uh, the emperor and the shogunate and, and forced the capitulation, finally, of the previous shogun, um, he took control, direct control, of Japan as the new shogun. Then, as you kind of mentioned when, when we kicked off the idea for this episode... There was the incident at Honnoji mm-hmm. where, due to somewhat sort of speculated circumstances, we're not really sure, um, one of these kind of great historical mysteries, this Akechi guy who was like one of his, uh, well, like lieutenants essentially. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, kind of an accomplice actually. Uh, suddenly just ups and just kills him. Yeah. And all this ninja stuff happens. And then basically Toyotomi Hideyoshi, who is this kind of affable but also equally calculating and ruthless guy steps in and he'd been part of the the sort of the victorious coalition that put Mm -hmm. oda in power so then he starts to implement reforms and various structural changes and new policies that prime japanese governance for the tokugawa shogunate so toyotomi basically took the absolutism of Oda Mm -hmm. turn it into began to turn it into a more kind of uh, palatable bureaucratic kind of uh, structurally sound regime but then Toyotomi Hideyoshi dies his son kind of comes up he's too young these elders come up as well Mm -hmm. to kind of be regents and then Tokugawa Ieyasu comes in and this guy is like again one of these very celebrated characters Um, and he has kind of the combination of many of the characteristics of his direct predecessors. He's clever. He knows people. He knows politics. He knows the military. And he begins to really consolidate what Oda and Toyotomi had started to put in place. Right. Right. Okay. So. Um, so uh, during this project of, of kind of reorganizing and, and uniting the Japanese state, mm-hmm. um, like in the previous system, uh, one of the major landholders uh, were the the samurai class. So they That's were right. sort of a mixed uh, warrior and peasant class. Mm-hmm. But uh, one of the first things done during the Tokugawa shogunate was to uh, redistribute the lands held by the samurai back to the daimyo. Right. Um, and so they were forced to either become feudal retainers or to um, give up their status as samurai and just become peasants. Mm-hmm. And what was interesting about this, just we're, since we're on the note, and uh-huh. it leads into some of the, um, I guess, our, our, our notes on the uh, the Kokudaka system, mm-hmm. the taxation system, which was partly aligned with the class system uh, that that developed the samurai in these in this sort of Sengoku period of war and strife that culminated in Oda's rule and then eventually in Tokugawa rule. Um, so the samurais. Uh, or the samurai up until then, um, yeah, many of them were professional warriors under the daimyo, but many of them were also just warriors who did well, mm-hmm. right? So in a way, it was sensible to push many of them back into, or you might even say forward into, peasant farm life, especially considering the class system in Japan formally recognized, even if it did not always uh, 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 equitably yeah. reward. Yeah, at this time, Japan was organized on a Confucian class system. Right. Uh, called the the four divisions, right? Which exactly. I think is uh, what peasants, samurai, yeah, nobles, yeah, it was something like, ah, and man, I, I'm I'm blanking. But peasants, like peasant farmers in particular, were seen as the backbone of society due to their, you know, provision of agricultural bounty and the stabilization of the economy from that uh, uh, labor. So they were formally recognized as the top of the like status hierarchy even though functionally they were subjects <laughs> right and they and they had to labor all day for years and yeah so it's uh scholars farmers mm-hmm. artisans mm-hmm. and merchants yep and the merchants were actually like in japanese society merchants were at the bottom at the bottom of the because they hierarchy. weren't seen as producing anything right of their yeah, own was, use yeah yeah the class was kind of based on a sense of virtuosity something like that yeah, yeah. and so merchants were seen as the least virtuous because they produce nothing but right the they're just wealth. like seen as like facilitators at best yeah 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 um right so society was 
divided into this uh, rigid class system. Mm-hmm. The samurai had their lands right. redistributed back to them. Right. Um, the daimyo were made in one sense they were made I guess wealthier but less powerful yeah because in the previous in the, in the Sengoku period you know daimyo were uh, political contenders mm-hmm. um, as a rule um, or or they were important vassals yeah and so forth and they were able to set taxation and right. rights and stuff like that right. whereas because of the decentralization in that very yeah. fragmented period yeah and yeah. so in the Tokugawa Bakufu um, the daimyo basically reported directly to the shogunate, and the, uh, the taxes and uh, fees and stuff were mm-hmm. set directly by the shogun. Yep. Um, so the the daimyo were able to collect taxes, um, but they weren't able to determine what the taxes would be. Right, and that's one of the more interesting parts of the system that we'll touch on. Right. Um, so... Let's see. There were there were about two hundred fifty of these daimyo, just to give you an idea mm-hmm. of. Um, it's about the size like. of what the House of Reps is. That correct? Am I am I off no, on that? House of Reps is like four thirty five. Four thirty five. Yeah, okay, yeah. maybe it was the original. Um, I'm dumb. Yeah, but it's like it's it's basically the one percent of <laughs> right. Japan. Yeah, yeah, yeah easily. Yeah. The peasants were like two fifty for a percent massive or country like the, Japan. Yeah. yeah. Um, Yeah, so even even within this, these separate classes, because um, Japan was becoming wealthier th- at the time, there was more intra-class division. So right. you could be either a poor peasant or a rich peasant. Mm-hmm. You could be someone who... Um, I, I think you could have no land um, in the worst cases, or you could have um, e- effectively total control over land. Um, mm-hmm. You know, lands, lands were divided up in uh, various, like administrative levels and um most peasants had only part of a fief and but but some had control of an entire fief and that made them like legit landholders yeah yeah um and then within you know merchant classes there were you know street merchants and there were merchants that were part of large state sanctioned monopolies Mm -hmm. um Within the samurai class, there were samurai that had their own vassals, and you know, at the very bottom, there were masterless samurai, also known as Ronin. Yeah, uh, which is a good movie from <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> with John Reno and Robert De Niro. Yeah, <laughs> uh, one of my favorites. Um, yeah, during okay, I, I guess one thing I didn't mention is this was called the Edo period because of a system called the Sankin Kotai. Uh, which was a system created to limit the power of the daimyo. Um, and so, mm-hmm. That's what, right. yeah, the way it worked yeah. was um, the uh, Tokugawa shogun, it forced all the daimyo to alternate living between Edo and the period that they governed. Um, and their families had to live in Edo. So f- on one hand, that, that put them closer to the shogun. And on the other, it uh, kept them away from um any people within their local within the region they govern in order to prevent them from accumulating too much political power exactly exactly yeah it was like it was like the the shogun and the daimyo's you know own say bureaucracy and retainers and whatnot had protective or, or excuse me shared custody of the daimyo and so they kind of traded weekends with them, but in a more like a year-to-year basis. Right. Yeah. And so they had to essentially split their energies and split their loyalties pretty... Yeah. yeah. Um, so during this period, again, um, Japan was coming becoming wealthier. So uh, merchants became much wealthier. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. Um, you know... Again, at the beginning of the samurai, wealth was expropriated and given to the daimyo. So there was a kind of inversion of the classes where um, merchants were much wealthier than samurai on the whole. And um, because of the rigid confusion class system, that was kind of a violation of of the class right. order because right. they were kind of like higher than the you, samurai. Right. So they, they had to conceal their wealth because yep. it violated the law. Right. And, and yeah, issues of face would be coming up. And of course, right. you know, um, 
if you have wealth but not so much status, that's going to be a yeah, a yeah. big issue politically. Um, so socially, this wasn't the best period. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there was a strict <laughs> patriarchy during yeah. the period, uh, especially among the samurai class. Yeah. Um, the samurai, uh, but other people too, um, valued virginity at marriage. And um, in the samurai class, women were expected to submit to their husbands. Yeah. Um, women of all social classes were restricted from taking additional sexual partners after marriage, uh, whereas men were able to take concubines and uh, have other sexual partners and stuff. Classic bullshit. Yeah. Um, divorce was common, uh, but what usually happened was the woman would just return to her birth family and yeah. live there. It seems like this was... I guess be a spinster. Yeah, it was like... It, it was kind of an exit they could take, but it was a bit of a downer ending. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's that's so all I have sort of on social there. history there, yeah, for the yeah, most part. Yeah, that's all I have on the social history. Do you have anything mm -hmm. to add? Um, let's see. I mean, oh... Not really. I mean, the, the, the rigid sort of class consolidation was obviously in favor of the shogun's control of right. people's roles and functions in the society. Um, one thing that was uh, something I love to bring up about Tokugawa society was that they began to uh, actually mass surveil everyone, but through, like, human agents who, like, and, like, um, uh, kind of getting people to spy on each other and mm -hmm. spy on their neighbors and stuff. And there's a theory now... I can't cite the source, but it's <laughs> floating around there that um, the kind of the extreme nuance and subtlety of um, Japanese uh, communication now is in part due to like years and years and years and years, in fact, perhaps decades and centuries of everyone spying on each other and being paranoid because the government could get you for something. Yeah. You know, especially when we see, obviously, you know, merchants got wealthy, even though they weren't supposed to, you know, women weren't allowed to quote unquote cheat, but they probably did. And because of this fucking double standard and, you know, all this other stuff. Um, yeah. And th know. that's actually my theory in case yeah. you're looking for a citation. Oh, great. Great. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so that's um, my dissertation for my uh, computer science undergrad. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, <laughs> I'm, I'm happy I found you. <laughs> Um, yeah, so that's pretty interesting. Yeah. And it they just do have very how... weirdly subtle mannerisms <laughs> yes. over there. Yes. You can really upset them yeah. uh, with a lot of stuff that we would never think twice about. But Right. Um, so another major change uh, during this time was the system of taxation. Um, so there were two systems that existed during this time. Mm -hmm. uh, the main one was called Kokudaka, and there was a, a lesser used one called Kandaka. Mm -hmm. um, and the difference is essentially, I mean, there's more differences, but the difference is essentially one is accounted for in terms of rice and one is accounted for in terms of coinage. Right. Um, Kandaka would, uh, is the, the one that uses coinage and... Um, that was developed by the Hojo in the 16th century. Um, the Hojo daimyo divided up his land among his hundreds of retainers mm -hmm. who had the power to govern it but not set tax rates. Um, the peasants owned their own land and homes, which is pretty interesting, but they were subject to the Kandaka taxation system. So the Hojo used uh, detailed and repeated cadastral surveys. Oh, we didn't talk about that. A cadastral survey is a survey to... Uh, to survey land and its value, and it's like a real estate stuff. survey. Yeah, you know, you go out and you're like, "What can, <laughs> what can we get out of this? How can we fuck these people up, right. basically, and get rich?" Yeah. So they had to determine how valuable the land was, so that they could determine how much rent or taxation to right. charge. Um. So yeah, the Hojo used detailed and repeated cadastral surveys to assess the land value and charge a tax to the peasants based on the value. Mm -hmm. um, so under the Kandaka system, uh, peasants received about a fifth of their produce. Uh, the daimyo received another fifth, and then the local retainer received the other three-fifths. Um, to simplify administration for the system, uh, villages were self-governing, and taxes were applied on the village level. So the village would receive a tax amount, and then the peasants would divide up the responsibilities themselves. And they usually tried to divide it up 
evenly. More or less evenly, yeah. yeah. It was interesting that that this is a kind of... It's not d- direct taxation. It's not... It's like a like a tier within a tier, you know, the, the, the daimyo was responsible for a certain amount, it seems Mm -hmm. based on these assessments. And then, but then they would essentially charge these village level units of however many peasants would work there and live there. And it seems to be a recognition of two things. One of course is the ever changing population. Mm -hmm. Um, and two, which I read in this article about, you know, sort of the arable lands as commons, um, seems to have also been a recognition of, the fragility of arable land due to inclement weather uh, events, disasters like mudslides, stuff like that, mm-hmm. um, especially that uh, the fact that all the new land um, at this uh, stage in their history was basically being developed on the peripheries and the margins where it was harder to farm. Um, they had taken up all the fertile valleys and plains already, and since it's such a mountainous region, you know that kind of says a lot for all your new farms. Yeah. Right. So the the redistribution efforts at the village level, um, which they could do yearly, um, was very significant for kind of sustaining the livelihoods of any individual household of peasants. Okay. Mm. Um, So, yeah, there was an extensive registration of peasants carried out around this time. uh, During Oda's rule. During Oda's rule, actually. Um, And let's see. I didn't really expand on that at all. That's all right. <laughs> um, part of the tax burden for peasants, um, under both systems, actually, both the Kokudaka system, the Kondaka system, and the Shoin system, mm-hmm. is a corvée, which is essentially the right of an official designated by the state to receive free labor from the peasants. So this could be either someone who's in the actual government or um, a landholder or retainer or something like that. Mm-hmm. So under the Tokugawa system, uh, work crews were not allowed to be raised without a state seal, uh, which was intended to prevent vassals from uh, being able to use unpaid labor for themselves and, mm-hmm. and accumulate too much power, essentially. Right. Um, let's see. So another thing about the Kandaka system is it tended to uh, be used by... Um, regions that were governed by daimyo with relatively more power. Um, so all of the regions that were subject to the Kokudaka system were uh, mostly controlled by the shogun, whereas um, regions controlled by the uh, Kandaka system were uh, more subject to control by the daimyo themselves. Right. Which makes some sense, considering the shogun was the one who implemented the Kokudaka system, the rice taxation right. system, yeah. and these powerful daimyo probably saw that through some accounting, some creative accounting, and maybe some trade, they could kind of get away with using their own coinage. Uh, is yeah, that one, am I off on that? Um, That's one my thing intuition. they did here uh, in this system was um, so prior to Tokugawa, um, Japan was heavily dependent on uh, foreign coins. Or even uh, private money, mm-hmm. um, but I, I think for the most part they used Chinese coins, yeah. um, and some of them were pretty old, not really well uh, accepted, I guess. <laughs> right. Um, Just so a lot they, of random. There was there was like good coins, mm-hmm. quote unquote, and bad coins, and um, the daimyo uh, using the kandaka system um, engaged in something called like. Ekufu or something, Ezi, I don't know, something like that, something with an E at the beginning, and uh, basically the idea was they wanted to collect uh, as many taxes as possible, um, but they didn't want to um, burden the peasants too much because then they wouldn't be able to pay or they would revolt right. or they would go away or whatever. Right. They recognized um, there was kind of a like a top-down balance of power situation that they yeah. needed to maintain. Right, and so what they did was they would accept different mixes of good and bad coins. So mm-hmm. the bad ones were obviously easier to get. Right. Um, <laughs> so they would vary the amount of good and bad coins that they would accept, um, you know, from year to year or however often they were um, mm-hmm. collecting taxes. Mm-hmm. Um, and so the, um, the peasants under the Kandaka system tended to have less of a burdensome uh, tax payment than 
those under the Kokudaka. Yep. Um, and I'm not sure if... I mean, mi- that might be because the Daimyo can't exercise as much power overall as the Shogun. Or just because they were more restrained. I'm not sure. Uh, in terms of uh, their use of coinage? or In terms, in terms of, of how the, burdensome the, the taxes Oh, were. the burdensomeness yeah. of the taxes. Yeah, that that's a good question. Um, I, I haven't seen any information yet on maybe like what made that difference, right? But it could be it could be very well be that power differential between the the shogun and the daimyo. Yeah. That would make sense. Um, so the Kokudaka system uh, was the rice based system um, created by Tokugawa, um, and it was based on koku of rice. One koku is the amount of rice that will feed one person for one year um quite a bit of rice it's yeah a few hundred kilos if i remember right yeah. yeah i think it says it down here yeah five bushels five bushels which is it seems lot. like it'd be more than that but well that's I, a lot of kilos i actually have zero idea <laughs> yeah <laughs> how big a bushel is uh, uh, yeah well it's not like i'm carrying a bushel around every day you know yeah um but a bush, yeah, five bushels of rice, you know, a few hundred, as I recall, is a few hundred kilos, which, you know, and like that's dry rice. Uh, you know, yeah. one of the things about uh, language, you know, is it tells you a lot about uh, the, the material conditions of a given, you know, society. And in Japanese, as well as in like Malay, which I, you know, know from other reasons. And then uh, I'm pretty sure probably Chinese and Korean, variety of other languages in Asia, they have a different word each for, you know, like, you know, rice in the field, uh, rice you just harvested, like uh, dry rice, uh, and then cooked rice, mm. you know. And so I looked it up just to make sure, and I was, you know, I was, my suspicions were correct that this is dry rice, which inflates something like uh, 300% when it's cooked, right? So you get, you know, a cup of dry rice turns into like three cups of wet rice. Yeah. So, yeah, you know... You, so, it's really pot, like 15 bushels. It's like, right. It's like 15 <laughs> bushels, which is a hell of a lot of rice. It's, so, it's it, it makes sense. Yeah. And and it's like a more or less estimate. It's like, you know, if you're a taller person or a bigger yeah. person, you know, you might need more. I could eat 15 smaller. bushels of rice right now. Yeah. I mean, I feel like... Easily. It, I mean, after this episode... <laughs> I'm going to go get some rice. Go fucking cook some rice. Um, yeah. So, uh, land was valued in terms of uh, this koku amount. And the interesting thing here was that it was valued on its potential production of rice, not just the actual yield of rice. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. Uh, part of the reason for that is in order to value it on the actual production, you have to charge after, which I'm sure makes it uh, much easier to avoid paying taxes. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Um, Again, unless you have an <laughs> extensive system of spies. Right. Which, which could help. Yeah. yeah. Well. Um, yeah, so co- the Kokudaka system... Um, again, uh, did uh, did all these cadastral surveys and valued land uh, by the estimated uh, yearly production uh, of the land in in an equivalent of rice. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, a lot of land was not used for rice. Right. Uh, they eat other things like soy. Right. Probably some other stuff. I don't know. Yeah, uh, um, I think they. I think that's uh, it, though. They, I think they had some like you know tubers and and other kinds sushi. of sushi. Yeah, right. grow sushi. yeah, growing the sushi yeah. on the tall, <laughs> elegant sushi trees. Yeah, um, um, lots of takoyaki plants. Right, right. Characteristically, uh, uh, sake trees. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and then of course there's they have big fields of Pokemon and. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'll never, I'll never forget the day I met my first Pokemon in the rice paddy. Yeah, and then you know, way on the outskirts, they have like pastoral peoples who, right. you know, um, you know, they're out at pasture with with their Kawasaki motorcycles. Yes, right, <laughs> right, um, a noble beast. They gotta raise those. Right. <laughs> um, and so those are all converted into equivalent values of rice. Yes. So obviously, one Kawasaki, quite a bit. Probably like 20 koku of yeah. rice. Um, Not bad, you know. You, all you need is three quarters <laughs> of a Kawasaki. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so the actual yield of, of koku was, was quite a bit lower. Right. Um, it amounted to uh, an average of 40%. Mm-hmm. Um, of the original assessment, right. Yeah, Yeah, that's the amount of revenue mm-hmm. they mm-hmm. accorded. Well, that's the amount of revenue they collected according to the estimate. I think... It's not. It doesn't mean that's forty percent 
of the Koku estimate because that would be crazy. That would be crazy. Um, that would be a lot. Yeah. Because I think the the estimated estimated uh, Koku was usually uh, the actual amount was like ten percent of the estimate or something like that. Hmm. It, it could get very low. Yeah. Um. Because those lazy peasants. Yeah. Um. So the reason that it was assessed in terms of rice because before it was everything was in coinage. Um, so they switched from coins to rice. Mm -hmm. Um, the reason for this isn't certain. And the two reasons, the two hypotheses that I found are kind of completely the opposite of one another. (laughs) So the earlier one from Awara in, in 1975 was that it would, uh, keep power out of the market by reducing the use of coins Mm -hmm. and by keeping peasants from engaging in the market. So if the peasants, don't engage in the market. If they don't care about the market, uh, if they don't have much use for coin, mm-hmm. um, then people who are wealthy in coin can't pay them to do anything. Right. So they have little control over the peasants. Exactly. And and we, uh, I, I believe this is kind of what we were talking about earlier too. We were kind of speculating on other factors involved in that. Like if you're a peasant and you are paying in rice, you know, and that's what your wealth and, and your and your kind of uh, market value, I guess, is based on. Your participation mm-hmm. in the market is based on. Um, touching again on like the the in- incredible uh, weight of five bushels of rice per year. You know, if that's what you're trying to pay, uh, and that's what your your value is based on in the market. You know, you're not going to be carting around like you know 300 pounds of rice just to buy something yeah. you're not going to be able to be very mobile and that was one of the purposes of the system as it was established so this could have been you know kind of just a convenient aspect of the system was like mm-hmm. ah it just kind of keeps them on the land they don't have any coins to really use they right. they just pay in rice and they stay there and they work until they die <laughs> <laughs> um so the other hypothesis uh again is kind of completely the opposite and mm-hmm. um i think part of the idea is you know, in, in the first hypothesis, uh, it says it reduces the use of coinage, and I'm sure they're going by the evidence of uh, just coinage not being used as much. Uh, right. Which, according to the second hypothesis, was because uh, there was a shortage of coins. Mm-hmm. Um, because, again, um, Tokugawa was the first um, government to mint any coins since, like, the 10th century. Or something like that. So they've been using Chinese coins this whole time. Yeah. Um, it's a new order, guys. Yeah. <laughs> um, so this is uh, Yamamura, 1988. Um, their hypothesis is that uh, rice was used to supplement a shortage of accepted coins. Um, and levying and collecting taxes in rice increases the likelihood that people will trade with rice in the market, which people right. were doing at the time. Right. Um, so there is evidence of that. And that also responds somewhat. Uh, let's just like take a quick look at again the kind of the the, the recent context of the Tokugawa uh, establishment when it was established. They were coming out of like a hundred years of war, and you you know you could carry coins around all you want in that period. This is I mean we're again we're we're going with two opposite hypotheses here, so we're kind of playing de- devil's advocate to ourselves, right? So the first hypothesis. It's convenient to carry on coins. It's inconvenient to carry on rice unless you're eating it the whole time. And so you stay on the land and, and you know, you, you work your back off. Um, the second, this other hypothesis that's in, con- you know, contradiction to it would be that coins might not be accepted. There's a lot of old shit running around and especially in a, an unstable time uh, and now leading into an extremely stable time and a, and a very you know, kind of strict time. Um where everything wants to be regulated uh, by the shogun and so forth, the number of accepted coins is going to be extremely limited now, yeah. and it's much easier to trade in something that has real and immediate value to everyone, right. which is rice. And I think there was like 200 different types of coins in circulation at this time. Yeah. Yeah, it was it, some, some crazy number. Yeah, it's like Because, again, there were, private, there were like <laughs> illegal private monies yeah. that people were using. Yeah, like little and, IOUs, and like people were yeah. like printing these Hansatsu things that we went talk about, where it's just like, oh, this is my house's like IOU fund, huh, you know, okay. so you can work with that if you want, you know, yeah. you don't have to, but, um, so another, th- I, th- I think that whole, uh, admi- administrating taxes on the village level, I think mm-hmm. that applied to both systems. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, possibly, um, collecting taxes in rice makes it easier for a village to 
reliably produce attacks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and there's yeah. not as it's not as ridiculous yeah. an idea for mm-hmm. them to all collect a huge amount of rice together. Right. And right. Pay all, Especially pay all because yeah, all this labor is necessarily collective. Yeah. That's one of the features of um like rice cultivation is that it's very laborious and intense. Right. Um and it requires, you know, as as they say, it takes a village, but in this case it really does fucking take a village. Yeah. 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 And so you know, it, it's not like today where uh, we take our the rice that we owe to the government and stuff it in an envelope, right? Or I you mean, know, pay pay via TurboTax or whatever. Every time I try it, you yeah. know. <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, April comes around and I'm scrambling to get online right. and fill out my tax forms so that I can, you know, give the government five bushels of rice. Yeah, um, like the stamps alone. Yeah, it's insane. <laughs> <laughs> um. Uh, I had something else, and I'm blanking on it now. Mm. Um, I think... Oh, yeah, one thing I should clarify is that even though they valued... Like, they measured taxes in terms of rice, Mm -hmm. and they collected taxes in rice, Mm -hmm. but they weren't necessarily only doing that. They also did collect coins. Right. And there were a lot of people that paid their taxes in in coinage. Yeah. Um, Yeah, and so... Okay, I didn't even go over Yamamura's hypothesis. <laughs> so, sorry. Their hypothesis was that uh, rice was used to supplement a shortage of accepted coins. Um, oh no, I did. I did say this. I interrupted you. That was yeah, my fault. Um, so the idea was that rice was meant to be like a near medium of exchange. Um, so it wasn't like legal tender or anything like that, but people would trade with it. Um, and and so by increasing commercial activity, by getting more people to engage with the market by trading rice. Um, the Tokugawa Bakufu, mm-hmm. as the sole central authority of Japan, would be in the pos- the best position to benefit from any commercial growth. Right. So, stimulate economic growth and reap the benefits for yourself. Right. Or, completely the opposite, uh, discourage right. economic growth <laughs> and keep the power <laughs> centralized. Right, right, right. right. Both One of, of the which, two. <laughs> both of which were their goals. Interestingly, you know, they wanted to you know, they wanted to keep the economy growing, but they also wanted to maintain that centralized command. So right. you know, pick your pick your poison, I guess. Yeah, yeah. So there's evidence for both. I mean, yeah, maybe maybe it worked both ways. You know, maybe at that time both of these mechanisms were kind of functioning in that way. Right. And this is kind of aggregated over the whole period, mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. it might have differed from. Yeah. Yeah, they, there were Shogun there were a lot Shogun. of. It seems like from from my brief readings of of this uh, this kind of material, it seems that there were various innovations throughout the Tokugawa period. You know, from like the 16th century on till the um, 19th century when it all broke up again. Um, yeah, but but like you said, this is all aggregated. This is all kind of you know the way economists think, which is not real. Right. Yeah. So speaking of uh, changing from shogun to shogun. Mm-hmm. Um, the Tokugawa period was uh, very much it, it is very much viewed as a uh, period of isolation from the rest of the world. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the first two shogun of uh, the Tokugawa shogun were actually open to foreign trade. Um, Ieyasu, the first shogun, um, commissioned a galleon style ship and several hundred smaller armed uh, trade ships called Red Seal ships. And pretty badass uh, name. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and they they both uh, traveled the world and um, you know met whites and all that shit. Yeah, <laughs> traded with people. <laughs> Look at those motherfuckers. Yeah, um, <laughs> but then the, the third shogun. Um, I don't really know what the impetus for this was, but uh, the third shogun imp- uh, instituted a policy of sakoku or closed country, uh, which put to death foreigners entering or Japanese leaving Japan. Um, some foreigners, such as Chinese, were allowed in certain places, but for the most part, uh, no foreigners in and uh, no Japanese people out. If you left the country, then you had to stay out. Um, yeah, Sakoku was interesting. Um, I'm 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 looking back over some stuff here to try to uh, recall why they got into that because both China and Japan, and I guess to some extent. Uh, various Korean regimes, uh, we're all talking pre-modern here, of course, had gone through phases of isolationism and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. They all believed in this kind of like central, kind of almost like 
um, cellular state with a mm. strong perimeter and like a very homogenous center and all this kind of thing. Um, so that was, and uh, you know, maybe that was just like the kind of the zeitgeist for, for East Asia for, for several hundred years. Um, but I'm struggling to remember why, um, Yamitsu did this. It could have been just, he was imitating the Chinese. Um, but that, that's kind of just speculation. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. But basically, the Sakoku policy lasted until the Meiji Restoration. Right. Um, until Matthew Perry, um, English guy, right? Or American Matthew guy? Perry was American. Oh, okay. Or Commodore Perry? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Commodore, Commodore, Commodore Perry, Perry. Yeah, yeah. He, he broke through the defenses of Japan yep. eventually. Um, so another thing that happened during this period, though, was that uh, Christians... Uh, came to be seen as a destabilizing element uh, in Japan mm-hmm. and were purged. Um, so due in part to their faith's dependence on the claim that... is this? Did you write this? Yeah, oh, sorry, okay. I attacked so, that yeah. Basically, it's just that um, the the big anxiety with with um, really any like absolutist kind of regime anywhere is that if a, if a, an organized religion or some kind of you know faith of any kind comes in, or even like an ideology such as anarchism or something else yeah. dangerous like that comes in and says, "Well, there's really not you know any need for this absolute rule for X, Y, or Z reasons." You know, then that regime is going to look upon them unfavorably. And in this case, the Christians um, generally um, saw that you know uh, the the Christian God and Jesus Christ were the absolute kind of cosmic authority above the emperor and shogun and indeed above the uh gods that the emperor was apparently descended from yeah. you know in their in their mythos and and in specific the catholic missionaries of course also insisted on an earthly power namely the pope and that in, in particular posed a foreign political in particular eurocentric threat to the legitimacy and power of the regime Due to their conversion of pe- peasants and samurai, can you imagine if they had just invented <laughs> irony at this point? Like, <laughs> yeah. Oh, the oh no! I talked to that guy too. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Yeah, yeah. Me and him, we talk all the time. We're just. Yeah, right. I talk to these guys over here. Like, yeah, you guys are right about your beliefs, of course. Right. Obviously. Of course. Yeah. Obviously, Why you know, not? I talk to the guy all the time. Yeah. What, what do you? He's. What are you lecturing me and, about it for? And he told me to tax everyone in rice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and and you know, he told me like he says you guys pray to him all the time. He, you guys are like his best friends and everything. He says you're really cool. Mm-hmm. Um, but he also says he wants you to listen to me. Right. Um, so I would advise you to do that personally. Exactly. Um, you don't want to piss off the big man upstairs. Right. You know, all you got to do is out the <laughs> it's pope. It's out of my hands. Yeah. Just got to out pope the pope. Except for all the earthly matters. That, those are <laughs> right. in my hands. Right. Those are <laughs> firmly in the shogun's hands. Yes. Yes. Um, but yeah, I think there was actually Red like Seal a Christian Church. rebellion. I think there was actually a Christian rebellion during this period, which is why. Yeah. They, were seen as a there destabilizing some, element. Yeah, there was... There or an attempted some, uh, rebellion that was immediately crushed. Yeah. And so they sure. basically uh, purged, ethnically cleansed Japan of fuck. Christians. Yep. <laughs> yeah, which, you know, <clears throat> not for ethnic cleansing, but right. if you're going to ethnically cleanse people, I think Christians are probably the best you could do. <laughs> <laughs> Considering it was, uh, in some ways, uh, an, an, an imperialist colonist attempt. You know? yeah, yeah, yeah. Um. So I don't really have a whole lot of other stuff here. Um, just my conclusions that I have here. Um, so the basic idea of the Tokugawa Shogunate was to centralize control over Japan into a single state, uh, which essentially persisted from its inception to today. Um, you know, there was a the Meiji Restoration, which changed mm-hmm. Japan from a, mm-hmm. um, a, a, a feudal... A, like agrarian system to mm-hmm. a modern industrial capitalist system. Right. Um, but, you know, there wasn't like some huge gigantic regime change other than World War II, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. The, the major restoration was interesting because um, that was the first time when they um, consciously and uh, successfully uh, restored the position of the emperor to mm-hmm. like the head of government right. since um, the pre Ashikaga shogunate. Well, there was kind of an. It was like the 1330s. There it was, was like the 1330s. Attempt. Yeah, it was basically that kind of mid medieval period. So it was, you know, several hundred years. Um, and they did it more or less. Uh, 
I don't know if it was technically a coup, but they just kind of just up and did it. And, yeah. And and because the, there was a lot of debate among these sort of um, um, shogunal, you know, f- officials and and um, you know samurai and and daimyo and like, what do we do about this? Like all these Westerners who have these massive guns. And, right. You know, yeah. So basically, what happened is industry. Commodore Perry, who's yeah. an American, um, mm-hmm. went to Japan, forced him to. Yeah, with with a free trade. Was it just one ship or was Freedom it a fleet? Isn't free. Huh? Was it one ship or a fleet? Ah, uh, man. All I know is that his, well, he shelled the fuck whatever out he of brought Tokyo, there. Yeah, whatever what he brought was so much more advanced than all of their ships <laughs> yeah. that he easily just totally tore through their defenses. Yeah, yeah. and fortunately, and then all they wanted was to open up trade with Japan. They weren't trying to like conquer them because yeah. they would have <laughs> if they tried. Yeah, exactly. Um, so. Yeah, Commodore Perry broke through the defenses of Japan and forced them to sign a treaty um, to open up trade with the U.S. Um, and that caused uh, like a wave of panic among the ruling class of Japan uh, mm-hmm. because they were so easily defeated. They were so behind the rest of the world. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so the, the Meiji Restoration was Emperor Meiji um, kind of... Um, got everyone to get their shit together, send Japanese envoys around the world mm-hmm. to study other countries that were yep. more advanced than them and to rapidly industrialize Japan over a span of about 80 years. Basically, they yeah, they consciously chose to um, pick the most advanced uh, uh, examples of all of the currently, like kind of the best in breed and the best like cutting edge technologies everywhere you know most of these were the industrial western countries you know so they yeah they they very assiduously studied the united states germany etc mm-hmm. etc this is why um japanese beer is actually uh derived from german beer recipes and production styles and all this kind of stuff and then um i think they you know they adopted like sort of prussian discipline and mm-hmm. uh i think shipbuilding from the brits stuff like that mm-hmm. um and Basically, yeah, they just were like, all right, let's piece it all together so that we can stay as Japanese as possible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they did it all for an ethnic state. That's right. They <laughs> loved it, and they still love it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I just think this is an interesting look at um, how states evolved from kind of the ancient system to the modern yeah. system. Yeah. We have kind of a whole transition where ancient states were very unstable they mm-hmm. were kind of decentralized mm-hmm. um there was nothing really like a i mean there were empires but there was nothing really like a nation a nation state right um and so there were all these changes specifically geared towards centralizing control and stabilizing the state mm-hmm. um because i don't i'm i'm so like i don't know my head's just not working tonight That's all right. very well. But yeah. basically, I, I don't know if I said this already, but like ancient states were much more unstable. Um, yeah. Especially like the, the earlier in history you go um, for the history of states, the more they were just completely decimated by weather events or diseases or bad harvests or yeah. what have you. Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, and so it was part of the uh, project of statecraft was... Uh, stabilizing the state and um, figuring out how to stop everyone from dying constantly and yeah. undermining the Especially power of the, the government. people they like the best. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> um, so I guess this was like one, you know, one wave of centralization mm-hmm. before um, you had the warring states period where um, you had locally powerful uh, lords, mm-hmm. uh, locally powerful samurai, mm-hmm. and by redistributing their power um, into a centralized government, um, they were able to create a more stable state. Um, and I guess the model for this is uh, the emperor, the emperor of Qin, probably, right? Yeah, yeah. The, the Qin emperor, um, that motherfucker, man, that guy was rough, but he was he was good at what he did. Uh, in terms of conquest and and you know he had this he was interesting because you know the chinese warring states period was a time of extreme uh diversity of thought and opinion mm-hmm. and kind of more or less in that period 
um, you heard from Confucius and Lao Tzu and all of these other, you know, like, um, you know, um, what was his name? Uh, like Mencius and stuff, all these, all these other th- Chinese things about like how, how society should be run, how yeah. it should be governed, how people should behave, what's right. the proper mode of relations between a variety of individuals and the family and the yeah. laborer and how stuff like that. How often should you jack off? Right, you know, right. Under, kind of under the heavenly <laughs> blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Um, and, and, and Chin was a legalist, which means that basically uh, he was an explicit like <laughs> like no fucks given authoritarian <laughs> um like and so when he finally took over and of course everybody hated and was terrified of him when when Chin uh Shi Huangdi took over and consolidated you know Han China as a single state under a single ruthless just dripping blood emperor <laughs> um he implemented his sort of legalist um philosophy of governance and just started slaughtering scholars. He actually consolidated the writing system from, again, there was a diversity of thought. There was also a diversity of Chinese writing systems that many of which were, um, I, as I recall, there were 21 less, characters for sword and he wanted to <laughs> right, get rid of them all and just and, make one. And he's like, one, we've all seen hero. Right. Okay? <laughs> one to one ratio people. Right. <laughs> so of course, in order to, um, you know, this is one reason he killed so many intellectuals and, and scholars and basically librarians. Yeah, that's why he shot all those arrows at the calligraphy people. Right, right. Kill yeah. the calligraphy people. Yeah. Because, you know, you write too much and you're too creative. Yeah. And But I, Jet Li was just too powerful. Right. So. Jet Li <laughs> nearly had it. Yeah. But he ultimately succumbed to the ideology of patriarchal authoritarianism. Um, but yeah, so Chen Shi Hongdi, you know, just like consolidated everything and that really paved the way for what you might think of as statism in East Asia yeah, um, because it was seen as stable, even though, again, they hated the guy's guts. As soon as he died, his heir was too young, and they just flipped it and turned it into the Han Dynasty, yeah. which was pretty badass most of the time. <laughs> um, but they had learned a lot of lessons from that, and they also didn't have to have the... Um, uh, they, they didn't have to go with like the kind of the moral imbroglio of like actually slaughtering all these scholars themselves. It had already been done. Yeah. <laughs> and so, you know, then you see that effect on later um uh japanese society where it's like well hmm you know we don't want to necessarily slaughter the scholars but you know there's these warrior monks that are kind of problematic we'll slaughter them and like you know like (laughs) stuff like that and and you know once we finally do in fact like you know purge certain um uh, opponents uh, or or like uh, like grossly demote them you know yeah um then we'll kind of set up the system where there is this kind of centralized authority, but again, the Japanese got to do it the Japanese way. So they kept their daimyos, they kept right. their samurai. They just turned them into something else. I mean, I honestly, I would have kept the samurai too. Oh yeah, samurai are cool as hell. Kind of cute. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. Was there anything else? We still have a bit of time to fill in. Oh yeah. Um, um, oh yeah. If you want to learn more detailed stuff about the history of this period, including, you know, which battles took place, mm-hmm. what the results of those were, who was involved and stuff. Uh, check out Samurai Warriors <laughs> for yeah. PlayStation. <laughs> it's a, uh, basically Dynasty Warriors clone, yeah. but it's yeah. in medieval Japan during mm-hmm. this period. Mm-hmm. Uh, you get to play through the incident at Honoji yep. and uh, see Nobunaga get mm-hmm. killed and mm-hmm. all that stuff. Well, you don't see him get killed. It, right. You just kind of hear about the news. Spoilers, right. but... Right. Uh, <laughs> and if you want to... Um, you know, dip your toes in if you haven't yet. If you, if you again, um, are not just a, a horrific, just socially humiliated basement dweller like <laughs> myself, um, and you want to dip your toes in a really, actually, artfully made kind of now classic anime. I want to say that does express kind of through implication or plot or otherwise express a lot of the the interesting social patterns and structures of Tokugawa era Japan. But through kind of like a fun semi-modern narrative, uh, check out Samurai Champloo. Oh yeah, it's one of my favorites. Yeah, that's a great one. Yeah, yeah, um, and also uh, a, a lot of the summary information that I got mm-hmm. from this mm-hmm. was uh, from a different anime. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so <laughs> perfect. Someone uh, wrote this paper. Uh, yes, huge, huge yes. paper, um, trying to determine from <laughs> evidence from the show uh, what 
period of time Inuyasha takes place. Nice. <laughs> and uh, they came up with 1550 during the uh, Tokugawa a, Shogunate. A big time. Yeah. yeah. So if you want to learn about, uh, you mm-hmm. know, kind of the underground mm-hmm. of mm-hmm. Uh, the uh, Japan under Tokugawa, yeah. uh, check out Inuyasha. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Because they may have had an effectively centralized authoritarian ethno state, uh, but there is always going to be dissent in yeah. every society. Yeah, and yeah. there's always going to be schoolgirls traveling through time back. Schoolgirls are time a period. major part of the right. revolution. Yeah, exactly. You know, gonna, there's going to be dog demons. There's going to be all that kind of stuff. Dog demons, um, all good boys. I remember what Orochimaru was. <laughs> I can't remember. Was it, wait, is Orochimaru Naruto? I think so. <laughs> oh, so. I'm thinking of Soshomaru. Soshomaru. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, I think he was a wolf, like a wolf demon, uh, like uh, a sexy wolf. Ah, uh, sexy wolf. <laughs> now we're now we're crossing over into um, furry leftism. Yeah. <laughs> um, Radical furry. Yeah, so I, I don't think I have anything else. Um, yeah. We have a lot of episodes planned, but... Uh, they're all going to be research heavy ones, so yeah, we're going to. I realized really earlier this week, readings. like, oh yeah, there's a reason that Peter and I uh, repeatedly did uh, interspersed all our serious episodes with, with news episodes that yeah, we barely yeah. had to do any work for. Yeah. So uh, our next one's probably going to be a news one or an anime one or something like that. That sounds and good. Then, and since I'm since I'm just getting on board, I think that'd be a a, a good fun lightweight episode for me to kind of contribute to as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah that should be good. As I've said i'm dumb and honestly i i don't even know how to read anymore so <laughs> um yeah i have some other ones just endless tweets planned out here um just a preview of some of the topics uh we're we're gonna be getting into the phoenicians oh yeah and um, that was my idea th- thalassocracy thalassocracies yes which is the That's thing right. that they Maritime are a civilization yeah and interesting then, stuff and then we're gonna transition from that into the dutch east india company uh-huh which is I guess sort of another thalassocracy, sort of. Yeah, sort of a thalassocratic empire yeah. in the in the modern. If you look up thalassocracy, yeah. uh, the Dutch Empire will be considered one of them. Mm-hmm. And then um, we're going to be going into the modern Danish Empire. That's right, of Maersk, the Danes, <laughs> uh, which is the world's largest That's shipping right. company, which you, you most likely have not even heard of. That's right. That's right. Um, and then we have we have a couple other topics. I started reading about Forex. Uh, because mm-hmm. I wanted to know more about that, and mm-hmm. there's potentially some interesting stuff there. Oh yeah, um, and then we're gonna have to talk about like Attack on Titan or something like that. Oh hell yeah, I love Attack on Titan. Okay, cool. <laughs> and I gotta I gotta stay on that series actually. Yeah, I've only seen the first season, so. Oh really? Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah you gotta I, catch up then. Grad school, you know, it does it to you. Right, right, yeah. right. Um, yeah. So I guess that's it for this episode. It's kind of a short one. Um, sorry, I didn't write out more of a script. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, my fault. Uh, it's I. I had a, such a busy couple of weeks too. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. It's been this busy. was fun though. This is fun. Yeah. So um, thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, uh, check out our Twitter page at Neighborside Pod. Mm-hmm. I'm at Handle of Rye. Chris again is at Solidarity underscore Goth. That's right. Um, if you want to read uh, Peter's tweets, uh, he's at Book uh, He he will be gone uh, for at least a couple months. Uh, he's working on. Um, like an esports thing, yeah. Um, organizing an esports tournament in the Middle East, so uh, Which sounds pretty. pretty guess cool. I guess he's an entrepreneur or yeah. something. <laughs> he's doing business deals, he's breaking away. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, we have a Patreon, uh, patreoncom slash mm-hmm. Um Send us rice. Yeah, yeah. You can you can pay in bushels Five of rice, bushels. <laughs> or you can you can pay in ton. <laughs> yep, yep. Um, we also accept Chinese coins, mm-hmm. but none of that private shit. Um, we'll, we'll tell you the mix of good and bad coins that you can give us. Yeah. Uh, just send us an email. Um, let's see. Twitter, we have uh, Instagram at Neighbor Science and Facebook at uh, Facebook.com slash Neighbor Science. Mm-hmm. None of us really go on Facebook, though. So That's where my mom is. <laughs> yeah, that's one of the reasons I don't go there because your, <laughs> your mom is on there. Yep, yep. I don't want to talk to her. Scary. She's always bothering me. <laughs> All right, bye. All right, bye.